Well, give me the whiskey ball. <laughs> it's fine. I got. It's fine. I got another one you're gonna like, but I hope that um, it delivers more than the bog oak. Oh, you mean? Because that was a nice whiskey. That was a great whiskey. But you didn't get the bog. You didn't get the bog. You say bog, and I'm looking for bog, you know? I think this is going to be subtle as well, but this is a gift from Matthew and Shannon Lorenz, Magnificent Bastards. Matthew and Shannon Lorenz, you magnificent bastards. How do you know that? It is. It's very long. Yeah, yeah. Matthew and Shannon Lorenz. You should change your names Matthew to something that flows Shannon more. Shannon and Matthew. I think if they did Shannon and Matthew Lorenz. Shannon and Matthew, that's better. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it flows better. We it should start better. with Shannon every yeah, time. Yeah, right, right. All right, so this is the famous grouse, which we've had. Yeah. And like, for a budget whiskey, famous grouse is good. Contextually, We had the naked grouse, a little it's more a, smoky. It's a decent budget option. Yeah. This is their cask series. Oh. Now, to talk about this, we're gonna talk a little bit about blending. Okay. But they call this one their American Oak so Blend. So not cast strength, but finishing nope. cask. Not finishing cask. Nope. That's why we're going to talk about blending. So this is cast strength? Nope. What's the cast series mean? Ca we're going to have to talk a little about blending. It's a blend. The majority of this... I got this. Look, it's an okay. American Oak Blend. Continue. The majority of the whiskey in here is a dominant use of first fill bourbon and American Oak casks. First fill bourbon mm -hmm. American oak. So like new American oak? It's possible, but it doesn't say that specifically. Okay. I would suspect it would have to be new American oak. Otherwise, it would specify like well, rye or wheat or something. Don't necessarily know. Huh. I mean, if they're a small enough quantity, they might not specify. It's just okay. American barrels. Ooh, that is... Smells very caramel yeah. and candied. I get a... There's some... What is that? A... Is there a, like a figgy plummy quality in there? I think it's figgy plummy. That's a little too dark for what I'm getting. I think more of like a no, I'm getting like a peach preserves, like a, or not preserves, a peach cobbler is the word I was thinking of. Bready, yeah, pe dessert peach. No, I, I'm getting that kind of darkness in the fruits. I'm getting a musty note, but I think like that's coming from the grain, not from because there's not a sherry. This is. Right? This is bourbon. It's all of your vanillas and your creams and your fruits. Figgy plumbing. How often do you eat figgy plumbing? Figgy, figgy plumbing. Figgy pudding. Uh, so figgy pudding, never. How often do you eat plums? Uh, probably two or three times a year. And fig newtons, probably like two times a year. I haven't bought fig newtons. Oh, but just straight up. Life. But just straight up figs? Yeah. Like five or six times a year. Because you go to like Whole Foods and my wife will get like weird things every once a day. Pick up a fig. Figs yeah. And, yeah. 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 You gotta spend your horizons, Daniel. <laughs> I had figs last week. I had figs this morning. <laughs> it's the weirdest flex ever. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. What a weird thing to brag about. I'm eating figs right now. <laughs> Damn it. All right. Yeah, and the maltiness is obviously there too. Mm, it drinks very soft and clean and vanilla and cream, almost water. It's so soft. Is that a 40? Mm, it's gotta be, yeah. It's, I mean, look, this doesn't have any of the weaknesses <coughs> that I normally attribute right. to a budget blend. Yeah. Right? I agree. So, so I, as a soft, approachable, budget blended scotch. Right. For a, again, contextually, for a blend, it's a really nice option. Yeah. It's low proof, but the flavors are well executed. You don't have any weird metallic notes. Mm -mm. You don't have any kind of like funky, off the wall um, flavors that don't belong. It leans into the vanilla of bourbon cask and the vanilla I get from old grain whiskey, but none of, like you said, none of the aluminum or, or metallic notes. So, um, Kirstein Campbell is the blender for Famous Grouse. Here's what happens in blending, because sometimes we learn things. Are you ready? I'm listening so hard. Not listening. <laughs> So when you're faced with, let's say you have a warehouse, you have 100 barrels of potential bourbon. Yes. Okay, there's 100 barrels in here. Any, we can dump them all together and it'd be a bourbon release. Yes. But you need to try them first. So what you do in your first round is you batch things, yes. which means you get samples of all 100 and you say, okay, maybe they all have these two things in common. Mm -hmm. They all have the cherry and they all have the cinnamon, but this, this one sort of goes extra peppery mm -hmm. and this one goes sort of extra oak. And this one sort of goes 
extra vanilla sweet tones, right? Yep. And what you do is you create batches mm. of like, of these 100, these 40 represent right down home plate with these characteristics, and then these out ones have outlier characteristics, mm -hmm. right? And then you take those outliers and you blend in proportion starting with the base of the most representative thing you want mm -hmm. and then adding the accent outliers until you reach the flavor profile to recreate what you had before, mm. right? Yeah. Now, what it sounds like she's saying is in the batch ones, yes. they pull the side, the dominant American oak. And sometimes you'll create something that's really amazing, but it doesn't taste like famous grouse. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, this is really interesting slightly to the left of the classic famous grouse. Yeah. I wish people would get the chance to try this thing that I try when I'm blending, yeah. but we always move past it because we it have to create famous grouse. It doesn't fit the established And flavor. it sounds like she's giving, they're giving her the chance to create some of the interesting things that she gets to experience while batching and blending yeah. that she typically moves past. But in this chance, chance, uh, opportunity goes, hey, what about this? So I think there's other ones in this cask series, but this is, what we're getting to see is, what if she stuck in her batching with dominant American barrels? So the more I go back to it, the more the I think. figgy plummy stuff right. starts to fade. And just a sweet, malty vanilla takes the forefront. Mm -hmm. And if you just step away from the glass for about a minute or two, then it leaves your tongue feeling with a finish. Same thing you would get with uh, Smarties, the little dusty candy yeah. things. Dusty sugar. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a very nice, approachable, soft, very simple, but no outlying weird notes. Yeah, it's hard to find but anything. blend. It's hard to find anything to not like about it unless the thing that you're looking for is, I want a wall of flavor, I want interesting, multi-layered things that just do weird flourishes and finishes and all that stuff. Yeah. It's not a funky adventure, but it's a really nice standard whiskey. And again, for a relatively budget option, yeah. that's one of the nicer things you can grab, a slap of a fish. <laughs> All right. If the name like that, it better be good. As a person who drinks exclusively whiskey, Green Spot does not have any coconut notes whatsoever. And I'm from Ireland, just as a side note. So it's a whiskey I drink a lot of. But, so there. But Irish coconut. <laughs> that's different. Ireland's famous for coconuts. Right. Yeah. They're, yeah. A, they're very coconut forward people. Yeah. No, actually, <laughs> I wanted to bring that up because the funny thing is I've discovered that it, there, there are certain circles who embrace subjective tasting notes. Right. <laughs> like, I just remember this thing and that's what it reminds me of. And so that's what I think I taste. Yeah. And then there are certain circles where uh, it starts to no longer be allowed to be subjective. It's like, no, that's not in there. <laughs> right? right? And the more you know and the higher right. into the making of things you get, right. the, the more two things happen. One, you start to sort of think, no, I do know for a fact what isn't isn't in here. Right. Right. And so when somebody says, I just taste smoky, and you know there's no smoked grain, yeah. that's an outside level, right? Mm -hmm. Then your first thought is like, no, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Right. So if if you're new to this and you hand somebody a space side that's not smoky, right. and they go, this smells and tastes smoky, and you think, it's not smoky. Right. That's the first, your first step into snobbery. Yeah. Because like, the real question should be, what are you tasting that your right. brain is interpreting as smoke? Right. So first, even assuming, this is a huge assumption, but even assuming that you are experiencing very, very similar things. Right. What that person would verbalize as smoke would be a different word that you would use to verbalize effectively a very similar thing that you're yeah. experiencing, but based on their past experiences mm -hmm. and their context and their understanding of what smoke is and how it presents in food and drink. That's the word that they're going to use. So and I'll, I'll know how it's made and I'll know it's a sherry cask and I'll think, oh, you're talking about the sulfur right. note that sherry brings to the table. Yeah. But what will often happen is, uh, and so that's the first weakness, is that you start to go, no, you're wrong when someone says something. The second weakness is you start to describe things very clinically based on process right. instead of based on experience. Yeah, yeah. And so you start to say, oh, this is very tailsy. Right. Or like, oh, this is very heads and faint. So, or like, oh, this is very long fermentation. And there's no one on the plant. That's really helpful for the people standing in the room making things. Right. So I, Very I, bad. I see this as, so a couple of things. First, whenever it's a whiskey conversation and somebody takes that tact, it's like, okay. Um, that's adorable. Let's talk about something else. <laughs> I don't say that, but that's mentally what I'm thinking. Like, oh, they're the kind of person who got into a thing and they see the value and the worth that they can bring into that thing 
as being able to be perceptive enough where they can be confident and say, this is absolutely here, and this is absolutely right, and this is absolutely wrong. I see that as like an intermediate level of understanding. Uh, past beginner, for sure, they have terminology and references and things that they can draw from in, in their experience. But past that, most people that I see who are career professionals, who are experts, get to the point where they start to realize, you know what? A lot of the things that I took as ironclad, hard, unconditional truths. There's so much variation in gray area and subjectivity whenever it comes to this stuff. So the true, like the people that are just winning awards and are just celebrated for their, their craft and their talent and their expertise, they're much more of a light touch because they're no longer so caught up in the self-image of making sure that I established, I know the right and true uh, irrefutable facts of this thing in a glass, mm -hmm. for example. Um, it's like, you know, there's a lot of different ways to approach experiencing, in this case, a whiskey. But it grows across freaking everything. I mean, people in music, people in politics, you name it, they'll get to this point where the intermediate people, it's like, oh, this is absolutely the way it is, and if you're not doing it this way, and if you don't think this way, then you're wrong, and you're an idiot. So, okay, we'll stay in it for a few more years, and you'll eventually get to the point where you are a little bit embarrassed of that, and uh, you become more gracious in your understanding and experience of the thing. In this case, we're talking about whiskey, but it could be so much more. I feel like I lectured people instead of reviewed a whiskey. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> Uncle Mikey's world. Did Daniel eventual, this is eventuality, mm, eventually. eventually get a smoking onesie? Yeah, we remember when there was ages ago, I was like, I need a smoking onesie because sometimes smoke gets, if you're in a cigar bar, right. it gets all over your clothes, not just your jacket. Yeah. Um, yeah. I never got one. <laughs> I did get a fireball onesie. <laughs> I'm saying. But that's not the same thing. No, because a smoking onesie should be a classy onesie. Okay. I don't know what makes a onesie classy. Peter? Maybe it has a cape. What the hell, Peter? Where's that onesie? <laughs> Peter. What <laughs> the hell, Peter? So I'll, you want to know the tact these, these things usually take? <clears throat> they say, hey, we need a smoking onesie. And like a merch guy or, mm -hmm. or something. All right, what about this one? It's like, okay, that looks pretty good. Like, how much and what's the order quantity? And then you it's never... like it takes eight thousand dollars for four. Right. No, yeah. no, no. You <laughs> got to buy six months. You got to buy two hundred. Yeah, it's like, oh Jesus, well, I can't sell two hundred smoking ones. Right. Either. I think this is a gag. It's worth about fifty or seventy-five. Yeah. <laughs> no. I, don't, I don't know if there's two hundred people that want a smoking one. See. Look, let's contact somebody and ask for a sample in a size small, and then I get my smoking one. This is about you. And then we're like, this is no, just about it's not going to work oh, out. Okay. All yeah. Right. All right. Well, I'm saying I kind of want one too. Oh. Well, we, we need various two, sizes to make samples. sure that the large is actually a large and sure. small is actually a small. Sure. <laughs> How many more videos do we have to do? Oh, uh, so many. But here's dividing, stealing, and drinking. If you fight, may you fight for a friend. If you steal, may you steal your liver. And if you drink, may you drink with us.